Hi, I'm Graham Purdy. I'm Illica's CEO. Today we are hosting our Capital Markets Day 2021. In the course of the day, people will be hearing management presentations from the extended management team, and we'll also be hosting tours of our two facilities. Firstly, our Stereax manufacturing facility, which was just opened last Friday. And secondly, our Goliath large format battery development facility. In the course of the day, I expect people will get an updated overview of the status of development of the company. Firstly, uh, an insight into the state of manufacturing readiness of our Stereax micro batteries. And secondly, an update on the technical developments that we've achieved with our Goliath batteries. They'll also get some insight into the operational environment that we've developed uh, and matured, particularly for uh, the Stereax manufacturing implementation, which is the next step uh, in the commercialization roadmap that we've got for Stereax. A very warm welcome to all of you for uh, attending uh, Ilica's Capital Markets Day this year. We're going to use the opportunity to have a bit of a broader introduction to the Ilica management team. So uh, in the course of the management presentation, uh, you'll get to meet uh, John Tinson, our VP of Sales, who's sitting just close to me here, and Robin Bell, our VP of Product Development, as well as Steve, our FD, who many of you will have met before. So let's crack on with the presentation. So I think most of you know who Steve and myself are, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on those bios. Of course, you can read up on them on our website. John has been with us for about two and a half years now, John, right? And uh, is building a magnificent sales pipeline for us to uh, stretch the capabilities of our delivery and make sure that our new Stereax uh, manufacturing facility is running flat out. Um, previously had a successful career at Sondrell, which is a semiconductor company, and SPI Lasers, which was successfully sold to Trump. Robin has been with us slightly shorter, just two months now, and has actually come hot foot from a successful trade sale of his company, Inflamatics, to Sewers, the big utilities company, and Inflamatics being a water network monitoring solution and also previously at SPI Lasers. So the two characters who'll be leading the tours, Paul Moron, who has a long and illustrious career at automotive, aerospace, and semiconductor companies, uh, and Brendan McCarthy, Group Operations Director at BMW, had a very successful international career with them, and uh, perhaps more importantly, has just been a key member of the team that built the UK Battery Industrialization Centre. So we're uh, making use of all of the knowledge that he acquired in the course of that uh, building programme to make sure that we make informed decisions based on that experience. So just to recap, a few slides, just to remind everybody about the type of business that we are. We are a global expert in solid state batteries. On the one hand, we have our Stereax, thin film, uh, miniature batteries, in particular for medtech and industrial internet of things. And then on the other hand, we are developing our large format Goliath uh, solid state batteries for EV and uh, consumer appliances. Medtech and industrial sensors, actually very interesting markets for us. We've chosen them really because of our ability to differentiate our offering relative to the low-cost lithium-ion incumbent technology. So for MedTech, there's this massive wave of innovation that John is going to talk about in a bit more detail with some case studies, sweeping through that sector, uh, which is all about electroceuticals replacing pharmaceuticals. So electronic stimulation uh, of our bodies to help combat disease uh, and injury um, as a replacement for uh, chemical pharmaceuticals, painkillers uh, and drugs. And then industrial sensors, um, really a 
an interesting opportunity there around the industrial internet of things, uh, in particular in hostile environments where solid state batteries and their resilience to higher temperatures proves to be a really key differentiator uh, against things like coin cells and smaller lithium ion cells. Of course, consumer appliances currently actually the biggest market for, uh, for batteries, but rapidly being overtaken um, as early actually as 2025 by the EV market, which has seen tremendous growth over the last year or so. And James will be talking about that sector when he gives his presentation. So why are, why are people interested in solid state batteries? Why is this a topic that people want to talk about and engage with? First of all, it's the fact that they're ultra compact. Uh, and this is particularly the case actually in automotive where you are integrating cells into more complex packs. And if you can get away with reduced cooling of those packs, then you increase the gravimetric cell to pack ratio. So that means there's more cell than there is pack. And by pack, we include the BMS, but also the cooling system critically, which is the cooling fluid uh, and also the pumps and the heat exchangers. Their high temperature resilience, important for industrial IoT, uh, as well as being able to be deployed in an automotive environment. Uh, and then thirdly, of course, rapid charging, both for medtech, where you don't want to have to spend a long time plugged in if you have a small implant, uh, and also for EVs. And what we shouldn't underestimate and what's becoming increasingly important is the uh, relevance for recycling. So currently we recycle only a very small percentage of lithium ion cells, uh, as low as 5%. Um, and the reason for that actually is that it's quite difficult to make a profit recycling normal lithium ion cells. Once you've stripped off the packaging, you have to take out the separator and then you've got the toxic liquid electrolyte to have to deal with. Uh, and if you've got a solid state battery, once you've taken away the outer <coughs> reduced packaging, um, you don't have to worry about that polymer separator or the flammable toxic liquid electrolyte. You can effectively crush up the cells and process them and extract the valuable metals and put them back into the supply chain. Um, our business model, well, at the minute, actually, uh, we are a manufacturing company. We have uh, been manufacturing cells on our pilot line uh, for Stereax. Uh, and selling those samples to customers who've been testing them and putting them into prototype devices. And uh, a spoiler alert, we've got some videos actually from our partners all around the world that we're going to show with you to give you some insight into uh, the types of applications uh, that uh, people are testing our batteries in. Now that we've got our new manufacturing facility that's up and running, uh, that you'll see later on this morning. Uh, we are able, of course, to supply a larger volume of cells and to support uh, our customers' product developments as they go through to market uh, and ramp up to address some of the very large markets that they're interested in. But ultimately, we will flip into a licensing model um, because we feel that some of the opportunities are too large for um, the capital deployment that we are likely to want to contemplate. And at that point, we will make our technology available for license to large OEMs, some of which actually have their own manufacturing facilities <coughs> and integrated supply chain, and some of whom will have their batteries manufactured by outsourced partners in low-cost manufacturing environments. John, at this stage, I'm going to hang, hand over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. So, yes, we've got to look at um, a couple of applications in the medtech sector, and then later on, um, some applications in the um, both consumer and, and automotive sector. So this is smart orthopedics. Um, this is very much emerging. There isn't yet, um, in fact, there only just in the, in the last few months has been a smart orthopedic device that's got uh, FDA accreditation. Um, so it's a market that's really set to explode. And the rationale for it, um, it costs a few tens of thousands to have a, a knee or a hip implant. 
uh, but it costs multiples of that to extract it if it hasn't gone very well. Um, and you know, obviously a lot of things are driven by medical insurance companies. Um, and if you multiply the you know, million or so implantations by the 2% failure rate, um, by the number and the cost of extraction, it gets a very large number. I did the math, it's a few billion. So the insurance companies are in for a few billion for these extractions. So why are the extractions happening? They're happening because the uh, devices, one of the reasons is people aren't taking the physiotherapy. You might imagine that in America, it could happen, couldn't it? You know, somebody rather large not doing their physiotherapy. Um, but also um, many other reasons. The bone growth hasn't gone very well. There's friction, there's, there's heat being generated, etc. cetera. A number of reasons why, why uh, an extraction might take place. But the earlier you do it, the cheaper you do it, the more successful it's going to be. So a, a smart device um, uh, embedded within the um, orthopedic device, uh, communicating over Bluetooth, that will tell you, um, it'll tell the doctor um, you know, what's going on very early and they can make an, an immediate sort of uh, uh, change. And we like this in particular because this is a, a non-mission critical application. Some of the applications in, med, in MedTech, if they don't go well, that's, that has a mission criticality. Um, this only uh, is used for a year and a half or so until the um, uh, implant is taken. Um, and of course, if for any reason you miss a Bluetooth communication, it's not the end of the world. Uh, so our, our device um, is needed because uh, you, you, you require uh, a bit of a boost of signal to send a wireless signal uh, outside, you know, from inside the body, outside the body. Um, and obviously you want this to be as small as possible. Um, so initially we'll be looking at um, supporting an existing battery but using our high rate capability. But as we raise up in energy, energy density, uh, the people we're talking to are saying we'll take out the traditional battery and, and use only the ILICA battery. So this is a, a pretty exciting um, uh, opportunity for us. And then Graham touched upon uh, a really big area. Um, uh, th this has sort of been going for a while actually, but uh, yeah, the smaller this can be, the, 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 the greater impact it will have on, on all of our uh, um, telemedicine uh, activities. Uh, you know, the opioid crisis in America, the over prescription of, uh, of drugs, the addiction that people got to those drugs. Um, most therapies at the moment, uh, it's drugs, pharmaceutical, as Graham was saying. Uh, there's a strong desire to move to um, uh, electrical solutions. And, and these sort of um, uh, large, uh, you know, the vagus nerve being one of them, um, the, the, the sacral nerve, there's a number of large motorways through your body that connect aspects of your body. The vagus nerve there connecting a number of key areas, you know, the, the brain, the gut, the lungs. Uh, you can treat things uh, by small impulses. People would know a TENS machine, I guess, when maybe they you know, were giving birth or the wife was giving birth years ago, a little pain device that you, you had that you pressed the button and it blocked the pain. Well, the same can happen here, but it's not just pain. Um, you know, there are many uh, mood altering or other aspects that, that can be treated by tiny stimulations. Um, and the moment, these devices are actually quite large batteries. Um, and, and these batteries have only got two positions in the body they can go, in the chest cavity or the buttocks, because they're quite large, they're primary batteries. But the move to tiny batteries will allow these devices to be placed right next to the therapy, no trailing leads. But the bigger deal is cheaper implantation. Uh, the big cost here is not the device, it's the implantation. If you can make a small incision with a day operation, a subcutaneous um, a location in the body, you can rapidly increase the throughput of uh, such implantations and more and more people can access this kind of uh, therapy. So very important sort of um, uh, future of, uh, of medicine. You know, I think you will hear more and more about nerve stimulation um, in, the, uh, in the future. Okay, so that's me talking. Let's hear what some of these prospects are telling about their products and about uh, Ilica. We are a company offering on-demand support and customized development of autonomous energy architectures for active medical devices. Our expertise is articulated around three blocks which are energy source, energy management and energy storage. So, in this context, Vitrivens is partnering with technology providers and academic laboratories on radical innovations to serve the future needs of active medical devices. For instance, we are working with Ilica to develop a dedicated solid-state macro battery for a sustainable medical devices. It's a self-sustainable pacemaker which recharges itself through a kinetic energy harvesting technology. So in collaboration with Ilica, our ultimate goal is to explain the sustainability and reliability of implantable medical devices.
Plus, offering better options for healthcare providers, which at the end of the day will drastically improve patient comfort. Bringing our expertise and innovation at the service of mankind is in our DNA. Let us together create the healthcare of tomorrow. Hi everybody, this is uh, Dr. Christian Chakravarti. Um, currently I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Nextim, um, which is called Next Generation Stimulation Technologies. Um, I'm here today to present on part of the Investor Day for Ilica, um, who we've been a proud partner with uh, over the course of the last six months to a year. Um, you know, the vision for Nextim is actually, um, we base it on three pillars, um, cost, um, access, and community. And we've seen the neurostimulation market over the course of the last seven years really expand in terms of both the science and the clinical outcomes. Our vision today and then for the next decade and ongoing is to really bring neuromodulation to the global market, to patients in terms of access and to really get the cost down so that it's affordable to the average layman public that may or may not actually have insurance to be able to um, use some of the most cutting edge therapies and technology. And our partnership with Ilica today is part of that evolution in using some of the most cutting edge technologies in terms of solid state battery technology in a lot of our first gen to multiple generation devices that we think is going to disrupt the field of neuromodulation and chronic pain. You know, it's an interesting statistic today. There's about 50.2 million Americans with chronic pain. There are about 70,000 implants. And that is a massive disparity that we as a company feel that we can solve with some of the best technology in class, as well as having a vision of how to get us there. So we hope that this video is a significance to the partnership that we, uh, we feel is really important with Ilica. And we really see the future of the two technologies merging and the community that we're creating around our patients really driving the change that the chronic pain treatment paradigm space in the neuromodulation market really needs to see. Thank you and have a great day. Hi, my name is Arif and I'm the CEO of Blink Energy. Hi, my name is Nadav, I'm the CTO of Blink Energy, and this here is our Blinky. In Blink Energy, we are developing the future of miniaturized power and communication platforms for smart ocular devices such as smart contact lens and implants. This fast-growing billion-dollar market of ultra-low power applications in the medical and augmented reality metaverse field all have the need of power. The lack of real estate in the contact lens or the implant makes Blink solution unique. How do we do it, Nadav? Well, I'm holding here in my hand our ergonomic smart patch called Blinkit. When it is placed on the eyelid, such as here on Blinky here, transfer the, transferring the energy to the contact lens, it allows wireless energy and real-time data transfer to and from the smart device. For example, a smart contact lens. And to top it all, Blinkit communicates with the smartphone sending data and receiving commands to transfer to the contact lens. Well, our ergonomic patch located on the eyelid enables maximum efficiency and has the smallest form factor in the market today. By transferring the energy, we enable companies to develop the thinnest and most comfortable solutions. For example, with the aid of the Blinkit patch, we enable the use of soft contact lens, where until today only hard contact lens technologies was in mind. We believe that solid state technology will lead the future of ultra low power storage. We have identified Elika as a key player in that field. And we believe that with the help of Elika, we trust that our product will be a standard of care in the field of augmented reality and smart lens and implants. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maciej Karczewski and I'm CEO of Wintac, a Polish company active in digitalization of wind turbines onshore and offshore. We design, manufacture and install 3D printed voltage generators for wind turbine rotors. Many of you have uh, similar devices on the top of your vehicle's roof where they are shaped to look like a shark's fin. Through clever aerodynamics, our vortex generators can improve efficiency of any turbine by up to 3%, and 
thus increasing the revenues of wind farm operators. Much like the fin on your car reduces drag and improves mileage per single tank of gasoline. Inside these vortex generators, we place an IoT device in order to measure vibrations and prevent costly turbine failures. To power our electronics, we need small and reliable batteries that can withstand many operational cycles unharmed. That is why we have been cooperating with ILICA. This coming year, our common work leaves the lab and enters the real world of large turbines. We are going to embed ILICA's batteries in our IoT devices and make a pilot installation on a Vestas turbine in Poland. We hope to be able to see ILICA's solid state battery on many more turbine rotors in the future. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy Elika's Capital Market Day. So uh, you probably picked up a very international bunch of customers there from uh, France, Israel, the US, uh, and Poland. So uh, let's change gear a little bit, uh, talk for a few moments about Goliath. Well, you could hardly fail to notice that the EV market is certainly taking off. Uh, this is some data from Bloomberg, NEF, and actually it shows that uh, their expectation is that solid state batteries will become the dominant technology uh, over the next 10 years or so. On that graph on the bottom left there, the purple bit is normal lithium ion cells and the light blue parts of the columns uh, are solid state. So there's a great expectation in the EV sector uh, that that technology will offer some key benefits, which will in turn allow the technology to dominate the market. <coughs> the key thing for solid state lithium ion is to reach parity with the performance of existing lithium ion cells and then exceed it in terms of cell energy density. Now, there are many different parameters that you can look at to characterize the performance of lithium ion cells, not only energy density, but also, of course, as we've talked about earlier, power density uh, and um, tolerance to temperature. Energy density is a key parameter, and that's what we've plotted on this S-curve here. The, the blue line uh, is actually the top of the S-curve for the incumbent lithium ion technology. And it doesn't look much like an S, just looks like the top of the S. The rest of that curve stretches back uh, about 30 years to the early 1990s. And what you can see is that there will be an intersection point in the next couple of years, and then Ilica's solid state, Goliath, will exceed that performance going forward. I also mentioned gravimetric cell to pack ratio previously, uh, and uh, this is one of the key aspects uh, of making sure that actually when you put a pack into a vehicle, that the majority of that pack is taken up by cells uh, and not the, the framework or the parasitic weight of the rest of the pack surrounding those cells. So John, I'm going to hand back to you to talk a little bit about what is going to be our first early adopter segment uh, for EVs, and then give some insight into non-automotive applications. Thank you. Yeah, this is going to show why I love my job. Um, so so uh, obviously, you have to consider cost. Um, when new technology comes to market, it doesn't come to market at the lowest possible cost. Um, a lot of money has been invested. In any case, it probably shouldn't come to market at the lower possible cost because it's due to deliver good performance. So we're looking for prospects and customers who want performance, will pay for performance. Um, and in the field of uh, automotive, obviously, performance car, it, it's a word. So um, uh, there's a number of different sectors to this, actually. There's, there's hypercars, supercars, um, and uh, high-performance cars. Uh, and, and they are actually all segmented uh, niches within this, uh, in this sector. Um, and they, you know, this can range from a, a, a $2 million car down to a, a mere £100,000 uh, car, um, but all of them in some way will pay extra for performance if you can show that you can deliver it. 
So uh, our, our job really is to understand them, and, and that's the job I'm doing now, is, is moving through these companies, understanding what their requirements are going to be, understanding the performance that a solid state battery might deliver. And often, as, as Graham's been saying, it's not the cell itself, it's the impact the cell has on the pack design. Because um, really, actually, this, it's about weight. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, these guys aren't necessarily thinking range, they're more thinking acceleration, performance, outperforming their rivals. Um, and you know, if you can save them 70 kilograms, you've actually taken a passenger out the back of their car, if one ever fitted in, in the first place, um, and, and that's gonna give you more acceleration. So, uh, you know, list of cars here. There's actually um, tens or hundreds of cars are typical production runs for supercar, hypercar, uh, and then thousands are uh, runs for, um, for performance cars. Uh, but actually, in the world that we need to care about, a, an entry point can easily be made for us in the supercar, hypercar, because the capacities that we're putting in place are very well aligned to the, uh, the kind of requirements that they have. But then there's a, a next step into the, the many thousands of cars, which to do that, you'd need gigawatt hour production. Um, and then actually, when you start putting the numbers down for um, uh, you know, even luxury cars, this is why the world is, is looking at such incredible amounts of battery capacity production. It, it's, it soon escalates and escalates. But the key point is the markets are more than big enough for us and we have a, a, a viable point of entry and we can sell the performance that, we, um, uh, that we're trying to create. And then we have, uh, again, this is why the job is, is fascinating. I, I, I hadn't really much understanding of, of some of the beauty products market, but I've had to understand it. And, uh, my family are quite pleased about that because now I kind of can buy better Christmas presents. Um, and these things are incredibly expensive. Um, so uh, there's a, a number of products out there which actually are themselves performance products. They're very high end. They, you may have seen them costing hundreds of pounds for, for a pair of straightening tongs. Um, um, but actually the performance comes from the battery. Yeah, electronics is fairly passe. The performance is coming from the battery. They get range anxiety even more so than drivers do. Um, so you know, you're about to go out and, not, um, and, the, and the battery's a bit flat and you, you, you can't go out because you're straightening your hair. Anyway, um, so, so that's the sort of um, beauty products market, a very big market, big demands, people will pay for performance. And if the um, OEM can describe the performance based around the battery, you get a premium. We've seen Dyson doing it. Um, and then there's a sort of uh, a point of entry as well is, is um, uh, th these are sort of portable battery packs um, used throughout industry actually, where people just need some, some power. These guys in, in that sector are saying, it's not really about performance, I don't care. You can be the same performance as, as everything else. Just give me something that's safe. And of course, that is one of the attributes we have is something that's safe. So there's a, there's a point to, uh, to have entry there. So this sector as a whole is, is so many sectors. You know, it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sectors and each has their own needs. So the important thing for us is to understand, will they value what we've got? Can we make it in the sufficient volume? Can we meet the price point? Um, and, and there's you know, examples there. So what we're looking at here is an 18650 cell is a very well-recognized item. That's the circular item that you see there. Uh, we've decided to shape something which is two of them side by side, which occurs very regularly throughout industry as two batteries side by side. We've all seen that. Uh, but actually we've made ours half as thick. Um, um, so you could, you could, if you wanted to, stack two on top of each other, or you could change the form factor of your product. Um, and that's our uh, uh, sort of what I take to people and say, if we made this, would you be interested? And, and the answer is typically yes. Okay. Over to Robin, who's going to make them. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you very much, John. And good morning, everyone. Um, so to achieve those aims of commercialising commercializ our products, getting them into customers' hands, we need to make progress, and over the last year there has been some very significant progress achieved, um, starting with uh, cycling the cells without achieving cell, cell failure, um, also improving the conversion efficiency, so, so making these batteries more, um, more capable, more, more, more efficient, um, and then working through to some quite fundamental uh, performance improvements in terms of using the electrolytes in a more efficient manner. Uh, leading to, um, if you look on the, the bottom graph there, the, the, only, the only thing really to look at is the arrow where we show some performance in terms of efficiency moving dramatically across to the right. So a few uh, step changes in performance which, which is leading us towards, actually on the right there you see process repeatability. So there are a number of tens of devices that we're now producing in batches which show that we have 
quite quite tight performance um, variability, which is what we need uh, for the applications we're talking about. So some significant advances there. Uh, what John and I have mapped out together is 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 a, a way of in, interacting with the market, interacting with our customers over the coming if, essentially two years to show them how we progress from a data perspective but also getting products into their hands in a controlled and very systematic way. Uh, you'll see there, um, we also have it on that bottom stretch, uh, where we, it, it's linking together with their um, reliability programs, us doing halt testing, highly accelerated life testing, and ensuring that when we have a product that goes to market, we've done all the verification and validation testing that a customer who's a very intelligent customer um, expects. Here shows a little bit beyond that pathway. So, so we're, we're combining here the um, process development, the technologies that we're driving forward um, with the integration into uh, modules, into packs that can go in, in this instance into uh, cars, um, doing what are affectionately known as mule tests. So putting these packs into, into a vehicle and driving it around the Nardo ring <coughs> or some, some other test test ring, which is all very exciting stuff for us. And um, meanwhile, while that's, that's uh, continuing, then we have to scale up our facilities. So you'll see today uh, the basic facility of the quad, and <clears throat> we are building that facility to grow its capacity. And the next slide, I'll show you a little bit more detail here. So our pre-pilot line is what you'll see. And then the Elica pilot is, is, is a, a very significant scale up of that capability, um, which gets us to a point where we can continue to interact with the car companies in this, in this case, um, but also the commercial companies. And then we need to scale up further to, to satisfy the demands of, of these customers uh, who need the significant um, uh, quantities of devices. And as Graham alluded to, to earlier, we then move on to, a, uh, for Steriax, for Goliath, we also move on to a licensing model to really get to those very, very high volumes which require very significant investments. So I think that's me done. Thank you. Morning, everybody. Um, yeah, so we last reported our financial results for the year to 30 of April back in uh, July. So there's been a couple of updates since then. Uh, the first of all was the completion of our fundraise. So uh, thank you for many of you in this room who all participated uh, in that successful process. So those funds were for the uh, acceleration and scale up of the uh, Goliath activities. So you'll, you'll see some of the team uh, later on this morning and you'll, you'll identify the, the premises in which we're going to invest significantly to, to make that big scale up. The other significant development has been our joining of the OTC QX Best Market. Our retail investor base has grown quite significantly from the US. And at the time of writing this, they were about 15% of the register. They're, they've now taken that on further with some of the liquidity that you've seen recently being um, absorbed by the, the US. So what we've done here is, is taking it away from the, um, the, the pink sheets, which are sort of the re relatively unregulated trading markets in the US, taken control of that, that listing, uh, which means it becomes more widely available in the US, so you can get it on all the share trading platforms. It also means it's, uh, it's listed in US dollars, uh, it's, it's um, tradable in US uh, opening times, and it's just made it a lot more easy for uh, those, those people who've been contacting us regularly trying to say, how do we get hold of your shares? Is this, is this pink sheet um, product the same as, as you? Uh, and this is enabled us to do that. So uh, we've made ourselves more marketable in the US. Thank you. Well, that just about wraps up our presentation. So hopefully you've taken away some of the key messages which indicate that we are uh, strongly positioned for commercial scale up uh, of Steriax now with our new manufacturing facility. We're maturing uh, the Goliath technology that we've got um, through a series of development milestones with key partners and uh, they allow us to pursue some key revenue generating opportunities. That brings us on to a Q&A session. Are there any burning questions that anybody would like to ask? Um, question on competition for the Goliath side. Yeah. How much do you follow what competitors are doing in this space? How might that competitive landscape evolve? 
Um, and are any of those competitors like you doing a sort of auto battery, but also the micro, um, the micro side as well? And, and does that give any advantages? Yeah, that's a good question. And you know, um, the the competitive landscape for um, Goliath batteries is more crowded than it is uh, for Stereox batteries. Um, there are very few players that have got miniature thin film technology. Whereas um, I would say that the competition landscape for uh, Goliath batteries um, is actually quite diverse uh, geographically uh, and from a supply chain perspective, um, as, as well as being quite numerous. I guess people are chasing what will be the biggest market and, and therefore, you know, that's very attractive to a number of organizations. So typically, you can split them down into um, technology developers like Ilica. So, you know, in that category, I would put companies like QuantumScape and Solid Power and SES. Um, and then you've got the incumbent battery manufacturers uh, the big guys that dominate the industry at the moment. So, you know, Panasonic in Japan, <coughs> LG uh, and Samsung and SK in Korea, uh, and then CATL, BYD in China. Um, and some of the OEMs themselves actually are getting involved in battery development. Uh, so from an integrated um, supply chain perspective, you know, companies like uh, Toyota, for instance, are well known for integrating the supply chain, which sort of flies in the face of what the rest of the industry is doing. Um, so hardly a day goes by at the moment without some uh, interesting news. Uh, only yesterday, of course, uh, solid power floated on NASDAQ through a, a SPAC. Um, and so we do uh, keep abreast of, uh, of that information. In fact, James hosted uh, an interesting fireside chat uh, that involved both Solid Power and ourselves. And we had a bit of a discussion about, you know, how we saw the industry developing and, and technology developing. Um, we, we do have regular reviews of the competitive landscape, just to make sure we sort of take a step back and, and uh, look at the overview. Uh, I would say, actually, that um, one of the, the interesting dynamics is that the tier one companies and OEMs uh, are actually spreading bets. So you can see that, um, you know, that they're not aligning themselves with just one technology. Uh, they often take the view that actually there's a number of technologies being developed here uh, and um, they would like to have a position uh, across the board in a, a number of these different um, candidate technologies just to make sure they're not caught out. Of course, you would do the same if you were a multi-billion OEM. You know, you'd, you'd probably bet on a number of horses rather than just one stable. Um, so yeah, has that answered your question? Yeah. Could you just <clears throat> expand a little bit on um, what you talked about with the batteries being able to recharge themselves and what sort of level that can get to, what the development opportunities are there? In, in terms of using energy harvesters. Well, you that's what, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, you know, one of the, um, the interesting aspects for uh, medical devices is where you have uh, an implant that has to last for, you know, <laughs> 10 years or something like that. It, that's actually very difficult uh, to do with a primary battery. So a primary battery is one that, you know, comes ready charged. Uh, you uh, install it in the medical device and then it has to last as long as the medical device does. And that's why actually some of the, uh, the medical implants that are currently used uh, are so big uh, because actually the batteries, although they have to deliver a very small current, they have to last uh, a number of years. And one of the attractions of using, say, Stereax is that you can recharge that cell uh, thousands of times throughout its lifetime. And that then opens up the opportunity for integrating energy harvesters uh, with some of these medical devices. And in the video from uh, Igor from Vitrovens, he was showing uh, actually a harvesting technology that one of their portfolio companies 
has developed, uh, which is uh, an implant into the heart, which is a cantilever device that harvests the energy from the normal beating of the heart, and that recharges the battery. And then when you get arrhythmia, um, that energy is sent as an impulse uh, from the battery into the heart, and it resets the rhythm. So that's a, an interesting example of you know, a perpetual system that effectively will last as long as the components uh, don't wear out. Um, for a lot of medical device implants, you would use um, uh, inductive charging. So that's the same concept that you use for recharging your mobile phone, where you get one of those pads uh, that you put your phone on and it recharges the battery. So if you had an implant, say, you know, in your arm uh, or on your neck, you could wear a collar uh, for a short period of time. And that's why the, uh, the power density or the rate of charge that the battery will accept is important because you don't want to wander around with a collar on your arm for, you know, for too long. But, you know, if you're probably quite happy to wear that for 20 or 30 minutes a day. Uh, and that then recharges the battery. And so the device has then enough power in order to, say, stimulate the nerve that it's attached to for the following day. Uh, can you, yeah, talk a little bit perhaps about um, staffing and how, you know, how much you're expanding your headcount and how easy it is to get the right quality people these days. And is it costing more and more? Yeah, no, that, that's a really good question. And, um, you know, Illica has grown to a company that employs about 70 people, Steve. Yep, yep. Um, and um, a lot of these people have got very specific technical knowledge to uh, staff the programs that Robin is running. Um, I'd say we're actually employing a different type of person increasingly. Um, when the company was first founded as a spin out from the local university here in Southampton, um, you know, a lot of the people that we hired uh, were uh, graduates in chemistry, uh, in particular electrochemistry, or perhaps they had PhDs in that subject. Um, and so we had quite a scientific core to the business. But over the last um, couple of years, we have primarily been, um, you know, we've primarily been focused on people with more industrial experience. Uh, and you'll see that reflected in your tours, actually, when you go to the facilities. Um, you know, we're bringing in people who've got experience with building uh, industrial organizations. And often, actually, in particular for Stereax, people uh, who are in a good position to be able to operate the equipment. So, you know, they've often got um, vocational qualifications rather than a university education, so HNC, HND type uh, qualifications, um, and sometimes actually come from allied industries. So actually the UK is very strong in printing and uh, in the food industry. And when you make a battery, in particular a Goliath battery, uh, there's uh, a lot of ink mixing, uh, processing and handling of powders, uh, and then printing and, and heat treatment. Um, yeah, on the Steriac side, um, outside of medical devices and IoT, where do you see the, the largest opportunity? Yeah, that's a good question. I might um, ask John to tackle that one, actually. So the question was outside of medical devices and, and IoTs. Do you think there are other sectors that we might be interested in? Well, well actually, the, um, the one that I mean, you probably would call it medtech, um, <laughs> You saw a video there of, of uh, contact lenses, and, and there's a, you know, is that to correct people's sight? Well, we know that that's not what Facebook is saying. They're, they're calling this thing the metaverse, um, and, and Google the same. And what they're wanting us to do is replace our mobile phones, or at least not use our mobile phones. Our mobile, mobile phone would be compute power sitting in our pocket. And if you, if you go on the Mojo uh, website, you'll see that there's a guy on a ski lift, and he's chatting to his friends just by moving his eye up and down. And when he blinks, He's actually typing. Um, now, I don't, we, we may all think this is crazy, but actually we're seeing some pretty big players in Silicon Valley saying, no, this is the future, and the future always looks crazy. Um, so you know, all this stuff needs batteries. Um, so it, one of the things I, I do, and it's what I love doing anyway, is, is if you go to two places in, on Earth, Silicon Valley and Israel, and it's like walking into the future. 
and, and people are working on stuff that blows your mind. Now, 90% of it will never come to market. All the usual rules apply, but something will come to market. Um, and it, it's not necessarily medtech, it's not necessarily IoT. It's something that it's hard to even imagine. Brilliant. All right. Well, unless there are any more questions, I think what we'll do is we will um, use this opportunity to organize ourselves for our bus embarkation. And that will get us to the different facilities on time. Many thanks for your participation so far. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, welcome everybody to the uh, Goliath uh, Labs at the Quad. Um, so we're going to show you on a tour today around the facilities. I'll give you some insight on how we make the batteries and the examples that are shown here in the showcase. Good morning everyone. My name's Clive. So I'm responsible here for receiving all the raw materials into the building. Uh, one being the R&D materials, which we have a look at and see if it's going to do what we want it to do in the first place. And then we've got our baseline cell materials as well, which we then go on to QC check, which you'll see some of the instruments next door. My name is Abdul, I'm a scientist at Inica, and uh, so we basically do the quality control on the materials. So once we receive the material from Clive, we do some basic uh, properties check on the, on the raw materials. Yeah, so this is the formulation lab. This is where the main formulation action happens. So what we do is we formulate our eggs, which will then be passed through to printing to be made into our active battery layers. So we start off with our cathode and electrolyte powders. Now uh, these are all both all moisture and air sensitive, so we work with them in the glove box. This just helps to their integrity. Then once we've got those, we add a polymer binder sorting <coughs> system, and that's what turns it into an egg. And what we do is we mix them in pinky mixes, which is just behind you there. And then we then pass them through the triple roll mill. And these are just a mixing process that helps to make sure that our eggs are nice and homogeneous. Good afternoon everyone, uh, my name's Keith, so this is our dry environment that you're currently in here. Um, we won't be going into either of the labs themselves today just so that we can maintain the stability of the atmosphere that's inside of them. Um, as you've seen, all of our stuff is formulated into inks and it's passed through to the south in the, uh, the lab. We will then use the screen printer and a number of different screens to build up our layers onto the substrate themselves. Um, so as you see on the video here, this is just an example of how we actually deposit the layers on each one. As you can see from the picture up the top, you can actually see the different layers of the cell. Um, what we do is we add uh, electronic contacts. Um, once they're added, we actually put them into a pouch, which is then sealed. Um, this protects it from the atmosphere. Once we've done that, that then gets passed down to ECAM for testing. This is our cell testing, um, so here is where we test our battery's performance and we do that inside the thermostatic chambers that you can see behind me. Um, so these chambers are used to keep the temp temperature of the cells constant um, and also to allow us to evaluate their performance at high and at low temperatures. Um, so this screen you've got here shows the typical um, data set for one of our batteries on test. Just like to reflect quickly on what's been a very uh, effective and interesting interaction with our shareholders and investors today. 
Uh, we've had some great questions from the floor in between presentations, and I hope that uh, our visitors have had some additional insight into the operations that we've got running at our Stereax manufacturing facility and our Goliath large format uh, battery development facility. Uh, I'd like to thank people for taking the time and efforts to come and visit the site uh, and I hope to interact with uh, all of uh, our visitors again soon.